And um, yeah, he's did a lot of exciting work on neural compression, which is a focus at Qualcomm AI. Um, you know, he did on, on overfitting the specific video instances. And he worked on fixing the rate and uh, um, in, uh, neural compression. And uh, without further ado, because we lost already some time, I was you know happy to hand it over to Keith. Welcome to the your talk. Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, that's in my second screen. Where is it? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry for the technical issues. So I guess uh, for the audience, the live audience will be the, the presenter mode, if that's uh, okay for you. Um, yeah, so as Stefan said, uh, my name is Thies van Roosnaal. I'm... Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Zoom is showing the uh, presenter view. Yeah, so wait, so I can probably... Uh, duplicate my screen. I have two screens now. now. Oh, yeah. Or I should to share the wrong one with Zoom, I guess. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So, mm. yeah. Oh, you mean this one? Yeah, maybe. Of course, it never works when you want it to. Uh, yeah, so I'll just uh, duplicate my screen. Okay, well, uh, in that case, uh, I think this is the best uh, we can get. Hope it's not bothering you. Uh, yeah, so the thing is, I'm full screen here. Huh? Oh. So it's somehow recognizing the two displays. And oh, I don't know. Yeah, but then, so for the Zoom screen, I seem to not be able to share the, the projector. Oh, okay. So I, I either need to share one with notes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, and which one is sharing through Zoom now? Yeah. Maybe then I can share the right one to yeah. Zoom. Ah, um, is it Zoom up? Oh, sorry, where is it? Mm. Oh yeah, and then if you can share that one, that could be awesome. <laughs> All right, amazing. Well, thank you so much. But then uh, we're a bit late, but I prepared for a bit of a shorter talk. So uh, I think we still have enough time for the talk and for questions. Um, so today I'll be presenting uh, some of the work by our group, uh, and this is work on instance adaptive data compression. And uh, so this is the case where uh, we actually train our models, we overfit them to the test set, uh, and that, as a result, we get better compression performance. So first of all, I wanted to uh, ask you, like, who of you worked on compression? Can you raise your hand if you worked on compression? All right, so not too many people. Then let me ask you, uh, who of you has sometimes overfitted their model on purpose? Again, can I see a hand? Okay, I see nobody did that. Um, so I can tell you it's, it's very fun because it's very easy to do. So the nice thing about this research is that we actually try to put it to good use. And then um, that enables quite a bit. I also sometimes personally use this for debugging right away. Um, but yeah, for this work, we're really overfitting. Um, so what I will be presenting today is joint work with uh, Yun van Sang, 
Johan Bremer, Taco Cohen, Iris Huibe, Reza Pureza en Marcus Nagel. So, uh, the talk today, I, I plan to start by giving a motivation for doing this kind of research. And then I'll cover two instance adaptive compression uh, methods. The first one is a VME based method called instance adaptive compression. And the other one is a specific case of this uh, neural implicit compression. And then again, I'll leave uh, some room for questions at the end. But please, if you have any question, then uh, uh, yeah, just raise your hand or interrupt me. And in, in case you're on Zoom, then maybe somebody else can look at the Zoom chat because I, I can't see it. Um, yeah. All right, so first of all, a motivation for working on video compression, because that's what most of this uh, research is focused around, is just that the amount of video data is, is fast. Right, so 82% of all internet, uh, consumer internet traffic is video. And with all those, those terabytes of video data streaming in every minute, uh, even if we can shave only a little bit of the bit rate, it has uh, potential to be very impactful. So then what are the current uh, neural compression methods? And I'll, focus, I'll be focusing here on the, the methods that achieve state-of-the-art compression performance. And they follow uh, the variation outland encoder scheme. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but I'm gonna uh, go quite quickly through it. So in the variation out encoder, uh, we have an encoder which maps from the input uh, to the latent space. Um, we have a decoder which we can use to uh, predict, again, uh, uh, prediction based on the latents uh, into the input space. And there's a prior over the latents, uh, P of Z. So then when we train these models, uh, we train them uh, with a loss that consists of two terms. The rate loss is just the probability of the latents in the prior. And the distortion loss is, um, it's basically a distortion metric between the reconstruction and the input. Uh, you can also view it as a conditional, uh, as a likelihood. So, and the rate distortion loss, we just weigh these two terms. So the rate loss is actually an approximation, uh, uh, an expectation, the expectations will be equal to the bit length that, uh, that your compressed representation will be. So you want it to be small and the distortion, of course, you also want to be small. And typically we just set a fixed uh, trade-off coefficient uh, beta. So at inference time, uh, we need the encoder and the latent prior on the sender side. And on the receiver side, we need, uh, again, the latent prior and the decoder. And we typically use the latent prior at inference time for entropy coding. So we can entropy encode uh, the latents under the prior, and we can entropy decode them then again. So this requires that the same probability model exists on both sides. And uh, in order to use entropy coding, we actually typically also use quantization of the latents. So this is basically doing lossless compression with a, uh, of discrete tokens under a probability distribution. And then of course, uh, because we are down sampling our latents and because we did quantization, we also have loss, loss in compression. So there's one uh, assumption here, which I wanna make explicit. It's, it's more or less of an uh, implicit assumption. But this is that uh, we assume that the model will generalize to any new data instance. So we train it on some kind of video data set, but now at inference time, I can give it any video and we assume that the model will just give good comp compression performance. So of course, you know, uh, you can already imagine that if you have very uh, OOD out of domain data, uh, the compression performance might not be good. Um, but who's to say that the model has enough capacity to even capture the entire distribution, right? This might be another source uh, where it fails to generalize or the optimization might be imperfect. So this brings us to the, to the uh, well, the domain of instance and that of data compression, where one uh, solution that we propose to this problem is to actually adapt the generative model at test time to the data that we want to compress. Um, so, for example, for every video that you get, you're gonna uh, find you some parts of the model. And previous work um, focused on mainly uh, tuning encoder side components. So also some work by this group, for example, realize that we can uh, directly fine tune the encoder or the encoder parameters, or we can fine tune the latents even directly. So for every video that we get, we can optimize them. We can get better compression performance, but this pipeline here stays the same. Uh, so that's why it's very easy to only uh, fine tune encoder side components. However, of course, the downside is that you're not utilizing the full overfitting flexibility. The problem, if you want to overfit parts of your decoding pipeline, is that uh, you need to transmit them in the bitstream. Uh, because if I'm going to change the latent prior, 
then the, the receiver needs to become aware of this update. Otherwise, it cannot decode the bitstream. So for these reasons, people, people typically limited the, the parts of the model that were allowed to fine tune. So for example, some works only fine tune the biases in the decoder. Uh, other works add a small upsampling or a super resolution network uh, that is very small, and they also signal it along in a bitstream. Um, but yeah, it's very obvious that you get, can get even larger rated distortion improvements if you could uh, allow for more fine tuning of more parts of the model. So for example, in this paper, it's shown uh, that it can uh, give impressive um, improvements. But what this paper doesn't show is how to transmit now uh, these model updates, because these models, even only the decode and the latent prior, tend to be tens of millions of parameters. So how do you uh, transmit them without inflating the bit rate? All right, so this is, I guess, the main message of the talk uh, for, the, for, the, for the preceding two sections is that we're doing video encoding by overfitting. So in essence, it's very simple. We just overfit the model to the instance that we want to transmit. And then we somehow signal these overfitted parameters in the bitstream. So that's the main idea. And with that, let's move on to the first, uh, to the first realization of that, which is what we call instance data of compression. So I'll be covering uh, works from these two papers. One of them is accepted uh, at ICARE 2021, and the other one is still uh, under review. So uh, again, we want to adopt the entire uh, model for every video that we get, but we want to keep the model rate overhead low. So we update the full model for every single video. And to reduce the bit rate overhead, uh, so the first thing is that we uh, transmit the updates instead of the parameters themselves. So, you know, uh, typically people train uh, these models to get globally optimal parameters. I call them theta D here. And then we're going to start with this globally optimal model. We're going to fine tune it to the new video. And we're only going to transmit the updates. So this is uh, useful because the update of delta equals zero already gives you a very good compression performance, right? Because this is how people achieve state-of-the-art performance right now. Of course, it's only useful if it's actually cheap to send delta equals zero. And to do that, we deploy a spike and slab network prior, or update prior, I should say. So it's basically a mixture of two Gaussians. And again, you can see that we have discretized it because we want to do entropy coding with it at inference time. Um, but under this prior, the cost for sending the delta equals zero, you can see here, is uh, very cheap. Uh, of course, this comes at the cost of the non-zero updates becoming more expensive to encode. So this already gives, it gets us one step closer. So if you would have a sparse update, then uh, this will ensure the update is cheap. But of course, how are we going to ensure that the update will be sparse? Well, that's very simple. We can just train with, uh, with this network prior as a regularizer. Uh, and this is pretty similar to um, you know, any prior. People typically do Gaussian priors, and it would come down to up to regularization. Uh, so here we just take this spike and step network prior. And um, this, so the negative log probability of the updates under this prior actually gives us another rate loss. So we can express this in bits. And this means that uh, we can just include it in the normal rate distortion loss. And we know that in instance rate of compression, the bit rate will consist of two parts, the part for sending the latent and the part for sending the model update. And because we have combined these two now into a single loss, any improvement that we get to this loss um, will result in better compression performance because the model uh, update rate will only go up. So the, 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 there will only be more bits spent on changing the model if it gives at least as much of an improvement and hopefully more. So this gives us a very advantage situation. We have a loss that we can overfit to uh, with the actual data point that we want to transmit. We don't have to care about generalization and any uh, improvement in this loss will result in better performance. All right, are there any questions so far? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, uh, given, uh, so maybe let me go to the next slide that shows this, the full algorithm, but a short answer is indeed, if you define your decoder as something that, basically you define your network parameters now as part of your graph, right? And the input uh, is delta is also, you can see it as a latent, latent vector, right? Yeah. And then uh, finding it is inference, is encoding, is finding the optimal delta. And then 
decoding is just adding it to your parameters and doing a forward pass. Yeah, I think so, yes. And maybe also one question. I mean, this is a, seems like a fairly general idea, not specific only for, for video compression, but also maybe in federated learning. Yeah. That's a, this has been taken off in, in other communities or? Yeah, so I think the, the, the problem setup is very similar to federated learning because in federated learning, so at the high level, uh, we want to train a single model, but on federations of data. So you have different nodes which have their own data sets. And then uh, basically you're overfitting to your own local data partition and you're syncing the, the, the gradients with the global model. And then you're syncing that back and forth because you want to train a single model on all these data sets. So again, you know, you have your own data. So in our case, it's a bit of a more extreme case where the data is a single video. In federated learning, you typically have more data, but also you want to communicate updates. So there's a lot of similarities uh, indeed, yeah. Some people uh, within Qualcomm are also working on federated learning, and I'm also communicating with this. There's, there's many analogies. There's also some differences. So for example, we only transmit the update once because you just want to start, you get your bitstream, and as soon as possible, you want to start to be able to watch the video. In federated learning, you train and every round you send updates. So you can allow there to have more noisy updates. You can compress the updates massively because you will be able to correct fit in the next round and you won't be able to do that for this, for this setup. Yeah. All right, then let's go to the algorithm. So I'll now just show the full algorithm encoding and decoding. So again, you can see here the sender side and the receiver side. And I'm also making explicit here what you assume to be known uh, to, to, to the two parties. So we have these global network parameters, theta d, both parties should know them, and we have this model prior. So, and something I also want to stress is that this uh, instance of compression really shines in the approach where you encode once, but you decode many times, right? So if you're Netflix or YouTube, you can encode your video very long and you're going to watch it to thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. And then this approach is really worthwhile. So for every video that you get, you start by overfitting this model uh, to this rate distortion loss, which now includes this extra loss term for the model rate. So then once that's done, uh, you can quantize uh, the, the model updates because we need to transmit them. And you can encode your latency under the encoder. Um, and then you can entropy encode the model updates under the model prior. And you can entropy encode the latency under the fine-tuned latent prior. So you can see now that the bitstream now uh, consists of two parts. So then on the receiver side, uh, we're going to go do the decoding. And again, uh, if you do this many times, it could be worth the overfitting that we had to do in the first step. So we received the two bitstreams and we start by uh, decoding the first bitstream, which uh, reflects the model updates. Uh, then we can add them to the global model parameters. And now we have again an identical copy of the fine-tuned prior and decoder on both sides. So this means we can just decode the, the bitstream that represents the latents and push them through the decoder to obtain a reconstruction. So that's the algorithm, the encoding and decoder algorithm. Now let's look at uh, the performance. And so as I said, uh, we're working on video compression and I won't go into too much details. Uh, but I wanna explain you a little bit about the typical temporal structures that are used in, in, uh, in video compression. And these are what we call uh, P-frame or low delay, uh, the low delay setting. So this is the setting where every frame is dependent on the previous frame. So we have an iframe, uh, which is basically an image. We send it, and then uh, we send every other frame uh, conditioned on the frame that came just before it. Um, and these are some classical codec baselines. So this is probably if you're using YouTube right now, you get these kinds of uh, algorithms uh, or if you're compressing videos. These are neural, uh, neural codecs. So you can see that they're already outperforming the traditional codecs in the, in the P-frame setting. And these, uh, most of these are variational autoencoder based, but they're not instance adaptive. This is the skill space flow model. I don't know if, if you are familiar with that, but it's one of the widely used models in, in video compression. And at the time of writing this paper, it was actually the state of the art model. Uh, and I've highlighted this in yellow because uh, we're gonna apply instance adaptive compression on top of this procedure, on top of this architecture. So this is basically your starting point. At t equals zero, the performance will be equal to this line, but with a little bit of rate overhead. The rate will be slightly higher, but because we have the spike and slap uh, network prior, it's so small that you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but after fine tuning, this is what the instance adaptive compression model looks like. 
so you can see a big uh, performance improvement relative to the to the yellow line, which is where we started from, uh, thirty percent in fact, and we also outperformed the other baselines, which is nice. It was not en enough to to get the paper accepted, but uh, we resubmitted it. Um, so here are some results for the BFIM setting. So this is another set, uh, another type of uh, doing temporal modeling that is very common in video compression. So again, the first frame is an iframe, it's an image. Uh, then we do a P frame a little bit in the future. But now instead of taking only the past reference frame, for every frame that you want to transmit, we take both a future and a past reference frame. And of course, if you know what came before it and what comes next, it will be very easy to predict what's going to happen. So you can reduce the bit, bit rate drastically. So the baselines have got on, uh, all the baselines got a lot stronger here. But you can still see that the instance adaptive compression, which we here applied to this B epic B frame model, uh, still does a, does a good job. So it kind of goes to show that it looks like this is a general flame framework that you can just put on top of any kind of model and it will increase your compression performance. Oh, here's by the way the animation for the B frame compression. So again, 20% BD rate savings and uh, over the base model and 20 over the over the baselines. So then uh, you know, setting our performance is great. This is the main thing and why we do this. But we also started to think, okay, since we're alleviating this generalization constraints, right, because we're overfitting so the models don't have to learn the global data distribution anymore, can we actually make them smaller? Um, because we're going to overfit them anyways. So we did something very simple. We just took this SSF model and we reduced the number of parameters. Um, so yeah, these numbers that we added to the names kind of reflect the number of parameters that you need uh, for the decoder side. So we went from 18 million parameters to 5 million parameters. And this means it's, it needs 72% less. Unmute. Okay, so now you can hear me. Hopefully it was not like that all the time. Uh, so yeah, this kind of, uh, the fact that we can make the model smaller and then instance adapted and then still get again, very close to this original performance uh, seems to suggest that indeed, because we don't need to generalize, the models can be smaller. And this is, can be very useful in practice. Uh, if you wanna run these, uh, these video codecs uh, really on devices, like on a tablet, and you don't want them to drain energy, it can be very helpful if you can make the models smaller. Yeah, so here uh, we just show that we did the experiment on a few data sets. It looks very well on, on, on most data sets. But then we also wanted to look at OOD data, so out of domain data. So it's known that uh, we train typically on natural videos. So if you evaluate on animated videos, then the performance is typically worse. This is already noted in the, in the SSF paper uh, by Argerson. And um, so what we did is we took one of these animated videos, Big Bird Bunny. And then we run the SSF model and we found the worst performing uh, sequence uh, to see 
for, uh, because we thought that would, that would be a good proxy for out of the main data. So that's what we did here. So here in yellow, you can see that uh, the baseline is really underperforming these classical codecs, whereas it used to be a lot better for the other data sets. And then with instance level compression, we can uh, kind of recover from it. So this gap is very big compared with, uh, with these two settings. So we can definitely go a lot more back into, uh, into the original performance, but it also has its, has its limitations, as you can see here. So what inter what's interesting to see is that, uh, you know, for the typical video, uh, less than 1% of the bitrate is actually used for communicating these model updates. Uh, but when we look at this Big Bug Bunny video, we see that around 3% of the model updates is allocated to these, uh, to these out of domain data set uh, model updates. So indeed, uh, it seems that uh, with this RDM loss, uh, really the model uh, seems to uh, be able to be flexible in how many bits are spent on the updates depending on how much it's needed. Okay, so then I have some perceptual quality results. So here you see a frame from two frames from the original video. And then here are some baselines. So this is the FFmpeg baseline. Uh, this is the SSF baseline. You can see that both introduce some artifacts. And then when we apply instance adaptive compression, we kind of recover at least partially from some of these artifacts. So this was taken at a lower bit rate. So uh, uh, yeah, nice. I still want to do left, uh, but uh, I have the backup slide. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to show in this slide is that, um, well, there's no, this is basically the no free lunch to them slide, I guess. So this rate distortion performance is stellar of this instance set of compression, but of course it comes at the cost. And the cost is that we're basically incurring a lot of encoder compute. Um, so, what we're going to show in, in this plot is uh, basically rate distortion performance after fine tuning for a cer certain number of steps. So some lines will keep popping up and it will reflect how long you allow your encoding time for the video. So you'll see that the first lines are the FFmpeg ones. They're very fast, but they also don't have super good performance. Uh, then you can see now the instance adaptive and the, and the standard um, uh, method, the, the, the standard SSF method. So first of all, uh, note that the uh, standard SSF method has no option to trade off encoder compute, uh, and the instance set of uh, compression method does. And it also uh, gives kind of any time algorithm. So uh, you can see that it keeps improving, improving, but you can stop at any time, and then you can get, of course, the current best compression performance. So another way to visualize this is, um, yeah, so I've actually uh, uh, mentioned BD rate savings before, I guess, but without really explaining it. So BD rate is just uh, the difference, the, the, the area between uh, two curves that you want to compare. So it's kind of a measure of, um, um, so the percentage tells you how much less or more bits you would need to compress uh, an image with, uh, with method B compared to method A. So we've basically uh, collapsed R and the D axis here into a single axis that gives the compression performance. And here you see the encoding time. So this reflects what I just said. So we have this anytime algorithm here. Uh, and these are the, the other uh, codecs. They are less flexible in that they also allow to, to trade off encoder compute, but in a, in a less thorough manner than instance of compression. Okay. So then the last result about bit allocation. Uh, so this is a bit, a bit to confirm that the spike uh, and step prior is actually enforcing sparsity. So here you see a histogram just for a specific layer, but it's representative for the entire updates. So the fine tuning definitely leads to sparse model updates. So you can see that the error by this delta equals zero is huge. We have to uh, cut this graph even. So on average, about 99% of the updates are still zero in, in our setup. However, encoding the zero update is very cheap. So you can see here a histogram, but not of the number of parameters, but actually of the bits that we spend uh, per update. And even though the majority of the updates are in this bin, we pay very little bits for it. Uh, yeah, I also showed this before, but only a very uh, small part of the bitstream is used to actually signal the model updates. And the compression ratio of the, of the network updates is also very good in terms of bits per parameter. Um, of course, this includes sparsity. So it's easier to get these numbers with sparsity. You know, because typically, you know, the most naive way to represent a parameter, it's floating point 32 bits per parameter. Uh, as we'll see in actually the next section, we can go down quite a bit, but uh, going below uh, below five is 
is, is quite dramatic. But again, this includes sparse ETP. So. Yeah, so that was um, the first part of the talk about instance adaptive compression. Are there any questions uh, so far? All right, if not, then let's continue with the second part about neural implicit compression. And this is just covering the single paper uh, by our group and I'll also show uh, a related work uh, by, some, by, uh, by another group. So first a quick, quick recap. Instance adaptive compression, uh, we overfit the entire autoencoder based on the global model. Then we quantize the latency and the parameter up, uh, updates. We entropy code them. And then the decoding is just first decoding the model updates and then decoding the latents and pushing them to the decoder. Now, neural implicit compression is basically a much simpler version of this. So you can think of an implicit model as a decoder uh, without any latents. So when we encode, we just train the model from scratch. Then we quantize the parameters and we signal them in the bitstream. And when we want to decode it, we just take the parameters, we build the model, and we do a forward pass, and we get our data. Like you were saying, yeah, yeah. So I'll go to that in, in this slide. Um, so explicitly storing your data would be maybe an array uh, or a matrix or a fixed length vector. Like a latent vector is also some way of explicitly storing your data. Um, but in implicit neural representations, you're actually the data is being represented uh, as a function. So not as a, as a data, but as a function. And um, the most uh, simple and clear example, I guess, is this uh, multi-layer perceptron, uh, which takes as input the X and Y coordinates, and then the output is the RGB coordinates. And you can use this to represent an image. So uh, if you're not aware of these models, I highly recommend uh, this gist. This is like a, a, a small web page which contains many references and many um, animations and visuals. But uh, it has been very successful uh, also in, in the fields of 3D rendering. So you have X, Y, Z inputs, and you can maybe predict uh, a binary op uh, occupancy output, or you can represent uh, other properties. Um, yeah, but for images, you would just uh, map X, Y position to RGB in the most naive case. Um, and then it's an MLP that you run for every pixel that you want to evaluate. You just put in the X and Y value, you get the color out. And that's also how it would work for compression. Uh, so you can just use it to generate an image, and now the network itself is the thing that you want to transmit. This has uh, actually a few uh, practical advantages. And again, you know, these are things that are not typically being talked about in papers. They tend to focus a lot on rate distortion performance. But you know, if at some point you really want to deploy a video codec, then um, the sender and the receiver both need to uh, speak the same language, right? We need to agree on, on, on the standard. And um, it could be quite difficult to standardize neural networks. And this is an advantage that you don't have by implicit neural compression. Um, so how are we going to agree on the variational autoencoder to encode videos with, right? Like who's going to train the model? What data is it being trained on? How do we trust that it doesn't have any biases? Because we know uh, that if we train on certain data, then we might get worse compression performance on parts that are very dissimilar to this data. So for neural implicit compression, um, there is no data set bias because there's no data set. Uh, for every video that we get, we train a new model. So these are some serious advantages which, which motivated us looking into this approach. Um, so these implicit neural models, so we call them f of theta here, so they're parameterized by theta. And we just uh, train them typically with a simple distortion loss. So we just evaluate the function at x and y, we look at what is the input at x and y, and then we minimize the distortion. Um, and then we take the expectation over data points and over x, y coordinates. So inference time, we would um, train this model to minimize the distortion. Then we would quantize the parameters. And on the decoder side, uh, we would take the parameters, reconstruct the model, uh, and do a simple forward pass. So you know the x, y grids, we can just generate, and then we pass it through. So uh, we basically worked on two axes to make this uh, better for, for compression. So one is to look at the architectures that we used for, for having these kind of models. So if you're familiar, familiar with neural implicit literature, you'll know that uh, quite early on people used Fourier features. I think this has kind of gone hand in hand with the success of, of uh, implicit models is these uh, periodic activation functions. So Fourier features, uh, you can kind of think them as uh, 
periodic activation functions that you apply to your input. And it has shown to work really well in training these models. And the, the, the reasoning is that uh, it's a lot easier to learn uh, high frequency components. Uh, if you train normally with the distortion loss, you'll first learn the low frequency components, and then it will take you very long to recover these. And it, uh, the idea is that it's better with these Fourier features. So this idea was actually generalized by Sisman. Uh, so instead of having periodic activation functions only in your first uh, feature embedding layer, you can do it in every layer in the network. Uh, you will need some tricks with initialization to get uh, the gradients to live properly. But these silent methods uh, are kind of uh, the state of the art for neural image compression. And uh, so we also base our model on these siren models. So lastly, one downside of these models is that uh, they're MLPs. So you would have to run them for every pixel position. And uh, even though MLP sounds like a small network and it actually is, the feature map will be very big. Because if your image is 1080 by 920 pixels, you know, every feature map in every layer will be that size, which is huge. And it will be, you know, number of channels will be also quite, quite big. So we simply uh, realized that the MLP is uh, like a one, one by one convolution. And then we also replace some of the layers with transpose convolutions that do upsampling. And uh, this means that we can have a lot of the, the feature maps early on be in a lower dimensionality. So then uh, we also have to work on the quantization part to reduce the bit rate because these neural implicit models tend to be pretty big. So what we do, so, you know, if you have a 32 bit floating point and say you quantize it to an eight bit fixed point, then you're gonna incur quite some, uh, your distortion is gonna get hurt quite a lot. So what you can do is quantization where training where the network can kind of recover from this quantization. Um, and we, uh, we do one thing uh, even more, which is a learned quantization. So per channel quantization. So for every output channel, we basically learn uh, what is the bin width and, the, and the, the bit depth that is optimal for this layer. So you can decide to have uh, to spend more bits on representing uh, and quantizing this parameter, but the, the distortion will go down, but the rate loss will increase. And uh, learn per channel quantization allows you to do this end to end. So it basically gives us again a rate distortion loss where your rate loss will go down if you choose coarser representations. All right, so these are image compression results. Um, the next line is our unquantized baseline here. So this is using 32 bits per parameter, just floating point. And then this blue line is a preceding work that came before us, which was the first to be no implicit image compression. Uh, this is the coin paper, and they do a very naive 16 bit floating point quantization. So you can see that the, indeed the bit rate is halved compared to our baseline because this is a very similar baseline. And then here in red, you see our approach with learned uh, per channel quantization. So it depends a bit on the layer, but uh, on average, uh, we learn to use about seven, seven to nine bits per parameter. And you can see that this further increases the performance. However, here in gray are the traditional baselines. So JPEG, I'm sure you all know, and BPG is the latest uh, and, and the best non-neural image coding baseline. And you see that we're pretty far from that. So in, in general, neural implicit image compression is still lagging a bit in terms of performance here. However, if you compare with the, this older version of JPEG at the lower bit rates, it looks quite good. So here you see the original image you can see that JPEG is incurring some artifacts at this lower bit rate. Our unquantized model uh, seems to recover from this, but the bit rate is greatly inflated. Uh, but then if we quantize it, we can get similar bit rates to JPEG and have less of these artifacts. So here's another one where you can see it very clearly if you look at these clouds, for example. So image compression, you know, we're catching up with the older generation of, 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 uh, of codex, but there's still work to be done if you want to get this better performance. So then uh, what we did in this paper is extend it for videos. And the way we did it was to, again, focus on the uh, low delay setting. So first we have an iframe, which is just this model I, I, I was just talking about. But then for the other frames in the video, we're gonna uh, uh, kind of exploit this temporal redundancy by taking the previous frame into account. And uh, the way this is typically done, and we are also doing it is by using flow and residual. So, uh, what we do is we, so you learn a flow, which tells you how all the pixels changed because typically there's motion in the image. So if you know how the pixels changed, you can typically warp them. And then uh, you already get quite a good prediction. 
So we use again an implicit model to predict the flow. So based on XY coordinates, we'll predict, predict not RGB values, but delta X and delta Y values. But now comes something interesting. Um, typically you would do warping uh, of the input image, but because we have our iframe model is an implicit model, uh, we can also do warping by just adding a residual to the input space. So if you remember the input uh, represented the coordinates and warping is just basically for having a, having a dense or having a dense coordinate shift. So we can just add this uh, displacement field to the, to the input grid of the image compression model for the previous frame. And uh, we avoid the warping operation. And um, this is something that might actually be useful again in practice. So depending a bit on your exact hardware, uh, warping can be quite energy uh, consuming because if you do warping, you, can, uh, you might have to uh, grab reference pixels from your previous frame. And you might have to access memory all over the place, uh, which can be quite costly. So it's a nice uh, theoretical insight, but it's also can have a practical advantage, which we didn't show in this paper, actually. But so then we have a residual model uh, also for the for the input space, and uh, this is yeah very analog analogous to these very to these warping uh, based variation autoencoders, but it's slightly different because we have this implicit setup. So in our case, we could make the flow model and the residual model 40 times smaller than the iframe compression model. And that's how we, well, at least, you know, exploit some of the temporal redundancy in video. However, if you look at the performance, you can see that even after all these efforts, uh, we're still underperforming the classical codex. So um, here you see these baselines, which I showed before, and here's even an older generation. And we didn't uh, manage to, to match their, their, their rate distortion performance. And um, yeah, we have some, re some, some ideas on why this might be the case, but it would probably be good to first focus on so, uh, another work, concurrent work, um, that actually managed to get a lot better performance. So uh, using a different temporal model and a different quantization strategy. So this is the paper by Chen, 2021. It was kind of uh, published also while we were submitting our paper. Um, and they, uh, so I'll just, they also have implicit models. So I'll just focus a bit on how it's different from what we tried. So first of all, the temporal model is different. So I showed these iframe and vframe temporal models to you before, which are very common in video, but they actually have a different model uh, where they use a single model to predict all frames. So this means that um, you just, the entire bitstream is just a single model and it has a time input. And then uh, you change the time input to, to decide which frame you wanted to predict. So then um, something uh, that they do, so what you might imagine is that instead of mapping x, y, t to RGB, uh, sorry, instead of mapping x, y to RGB, you now just map x, y, t to RGB, which would be kind of the implicit way of doing it. But they say that for good performance, they actually found it beneficial to do it differently. So they only map the time to a full frame. So they have a time index, then they have a periodical activation uh, function. Then they have a fixed length vector, they reshape it, and then they turn it, they, uh, they have some transpo trans transpose convolutions that in the end predict an output frame. So this last part of the network here, it looks a lot more like, like a traditional vision architectures with value activations than, uh, and without any X, Y coordinates than actually like an implicit model. And they say that this is also, they show an ablation that it's also very helpful to get this good performance. So lastly, they use weight quantization, which we also did, but they also use weight pruning. So again, like in the instance data compression, they try to use sparsity to get better bit rate, uh, to get lower bit rates. And they do some uh, additional entropy coding. So here's the, the results for their paper. So here again are some baselines. Uh, I focused on the on the B frame setting here because it's the most comparable. And here is the nerve model. So you can see that in this, this plot it doesn't look so great. Uh, but again, it's a B frame setting, so all the other baselines are uh, are better. In fact, uh, it is competitive with B frame baselines, so it's kind of comparable with SSF performance. And in terms of the neural and business video compression, it's 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 the best performing model. Uh, however, it doesn't match with the other B-frame um, based uh, compression models. And um, this would be the right comparison to make because if you want to use this nerve uh, 
a model, you would need to first decode the entire bitstream because you can start to watch the first frame. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword again because it allows them to reduce a lot of the temporal redundancies, but the setting becomes less spectacle, more of an offline compression setting. And again, uh, for any of these methods that I presented, these new implicit methods, you have to overfit the model to the entire video or image. So it's going to take a lot of time, training models, right? So just like instance out of compression, it's very slow. Um, so if you compare it against instant out of compression, then the performance is not so great yet. Again, this field is very fresh. So you know we can expect more breakthroughs to come in this field. However, one hypothesis uh, that we have is that um, these implicit neural representations, at least traditionally, um, they don't require a pre-trained pre -trained model. And as I said before, it has an advantage because you don't have data set bias, you don't have to worry about standardizing this model. Um, but we argue and um, that it also makes it very difficult to, good, to get good uh, compression performance because you have to learn everything from scratch. Right? Even if you think of these classical codecs, they get better and better, but they do so by writing more code, which becomes part of the codex. So they're kind of increasing the shared knowledge uh, that you all have and that you can exploit. Right? So you can send very short bit sequences to already get good compression performance. Um, and uh, one, uh, one, one uh, finding that kind of supports this, 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 this reasoning is that more and more of the papers in implicit models start to actually uh, reintroduce these global models. So for example, Strum et al, they, what, what people do is they use meta-learning to train a global model that you can use to bootstrap your neural implicit model. So you start training again from a global model. And then uh, this Strum paper, they then even do kind of instance adaptive style coding where you only transmit the deltas. Um, so that's, that is something that is very helpful in getting these neural implicit uh, representations up to, up to better comfort compression performance. All right. So then that's also all that I wanted to say about neural implicit compression. So let me just go to the last slide and then we might still have some time for questions. So in conclusion, instances out of compression can make up for the generalization gap in conventional VAE-based compression. And maybe more, interest, more interestingly, it actually shows that, that this gap uh, somehow exists because we can uh, exploit it. It has the potential to greatly improve RD performance and also it allows to reduce the model size because you don't need to generalize anymore. For neural implicit compression, uh, it has some practical advantages such as uh, no data set bias and easier of sharing of these neural codecs, but they have yet to catch up in terms of rate distortion performance. Okay, with that said, thank you all for your time and attention and uh, are there any questions? Yeah, it's a good question. So I also thought a lot about this. So why does it even work? Because we're kind of using a very similar loss at train and at test time. So then why is it not sufficient at train time? And I think this is also actually would be interesting uh, area of research to pursue this because I think you could come up with uh, some hypothesis uh, and then try to rule them out. So one of them, of course, is also longer training, uh, right? So this instance that method, maybe if you would have trained the model, the global model for two years, uh, it would also give give closure to this performance. Uh, another uh, thing could be also. Um, yeah, the model capacity. So it, it would just be very difficult to make the model big enough to really generalize uh, as well as instance of compression. That's one theory. Um, yeah, so I think this, this is a question that remains to be answered. But I agree with you that fundamentally, if you really think it through, uh, in theory, you should be able to come up with a training procedure where this would not add anything, instance of compression. Right, but uh, in practice, there's like optimization issues, there's model capacity issues, 
there's data set issues. So maybe that's, and I, I think it should be able to actually, uh, you know, empirically define experiments to investigate to what extent each of these things plays a role. Yeah, but I won't know at this moment because I, 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 I did some small experiments, but yeah, I can't really tell. Yeah, thanks. Is there one more question about the business? Maybe you can mm -hmm. ask about some question, but more about these statistics, your recommendations. I've actually seen a lot of work in the sort of more generative models in this space. I mean, or is it mostly a supervised network? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, also, first a disclaimer, and luckily, I'm not the first author. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, I'm not extremely up to date with this literature, but um, yeah, I do have seen that people also start to play around with, um, so first of all, typically you have one MLP for the entire scene, but especially for 2D scenes, people are also using with, people also started to then have specialized MLPs for different regions and also even introducing latent variables. Um, so yeah, but this, when they introduce this latent variables, they also introduce the prior over it. I, I guess that that's the closest I know uh, they got with it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 um, yeah, it's it's a good question. So you know, to be honest, sometimes for compression, we even move more away from these uh, probabilistic interpretations. So for example, this variational autoencoder. Uh, as far as I know. Well, maybe again, uh, I know actually some work by this group, which might disprove my point, but many, uh, many of the, of the state-of-the-art baselines actually use deterministic encoders, um, which of course you can think of it as a VAE. Uh, you know, of course, why can your encoder not be deterministic, but it's, it's slightly different. It's maybe less probabilistic interpretation. Um, yeah, so I also wonder if, it, if, it, if maybe for compression, um, you need these things, but yeah, I guess for generalization, you know, you, you would, because you would want to learn a data distribution. You want to learn a distribution over data. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions maybe? Oh. Any questions on Zoom? So you can type them in the chat. Yeah, if there are no questions, I think we're also running out of time. So, uh, you know, I'm always, uh, if you come up with something after this, then uh, you can always shoot me an email. Always excited to talk about uh, these things. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Too.